desire to do your will Your Lord is in my heart I will proclaim Your righteousness in the assembly I do not see My lips as you know Good morning to you all this morning. Uh, it's good to be together, even though we're online. Uh, there are a few of us here in the church. When I say few, there is five, five of us. Uh, so thank you for those who are serving. A uh, couple of notices. First is, as you would have read in your um, staying in touch email, uh, Dorothy Smith passed away in the last week, uh, 93 years old. Uh, Dorothy's been tangled up in the present church for a very, very long time to live not far from the old Rippleside building as well. So there'll be a funeral Thanksgiving service for her uh, next week. Uh, obviously with COVID, there'll be uh, restrictions around that, but it was always only ever gonna be a private family funeral. So keep the uh, Smith family in prayer, um, particularly for her family, that there might be some gospel hope uh, presented at this funeral. Uh, also, uh, a couple of other things to keep an eye on. Uh, obviously, with COVID, uh, we're in another lockdown. Uh, there's a good chance the lockdown might be extended. Uh, and as I said the other week, look, this is going to happen uh, on more than a few more occasions before the end of this year. So we're going to have to find ways of working through. Um, and it means probably we're going to have to do a lot of our studies through Zoom. So no one really likes doing that, but it looks like that's probably going to be the way forward. So next week... Um, you'll be able to do your refresh groups on Zoom. So speak to your leaders and hopefully they'll arrange that. And then obviously keep an eye out for an email as we know more information will certainly inform you of that. Uh, and then just, just lastly, on a, a relatively positive note, uh, Isaiah turns 21 today. I would go and see you, son. Yeah, but I'm not allowed to, to keep you safe. So 21, my job's done, it's finished. Uh, don't mess it up from here on. All right, I'm going to call you to worship. I'm going to do that from Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 10. But just by way of context, here is uh, the author of Hebrews, probably Luke. And he's describing how Jesus' fulfillment of all the Levitical laws, how he was, fulfills all the sacrifices. Indeed, he fulfills actually the high priest role. And this is what he says in verse 10 of chapter 10. And by that will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And every priest stands daily at the service offering repeatedly the same sacrifices which can never take away our sins. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God waiting for that time until the enemies should be made a footstool for his feet. For by a single offering, he has perfected for all time those who have been sanctified. And the Holy Spirit also bears witness to us. For after this saying, this is the covenant that I've made with them. After those days, declares the Lord, and I will put my laws on their hearts and write them on their minds. Then he adds, and I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. Amen. Well, we have such a great high priest. So as we gather for worship, we're going to uh, come before the throne, uh, come before Christ, who has made a once-for-all sacrifice on our behalf. Let's, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that Jesus Christ is the fulfilment of all of the Old Testament, of every prophecy, uh, of every type, of every shadow of every sacrifice, of every office, prophet, priest, king and sage. And that in these last days, Jesus the Christ came into this world, veiling all of his glory in human flesh, and then had a three-year public ministry where we saw what it was to see God walk amongst us on earth. And where in obedience to your law, he lived a life of perfect sacrifice, loving God and neighbour. And then, 
as a fulfillment of that obedience, he went to the cross. And so that the one who was without sin became sin for us, so that sin might be dealt with once for all. So there was no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Lord, we know these truths, but bring them with clarity to our hearts. That we know if we were to confess our sin, that you are faithful and just. And that you have promised that you would forgive us and cleanse us for all of our unrighteousness. Would you do that even now? Would you remove both our sin and our guilt and grant to us the joy of your salvation? Fill us with your Holy Spirit. Speak to us through your word. Bless us in community. For we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let's... um, Sing our first song of praise. We'll stand, we'll sing together. Only by grace may we enter. Only by grace can we enter. Only by grace can we stand. Not by our human endeavor, but by the blood of the Lamb. Into your presence you call us, you call us to come. Into your presence you draw us, and now by your grace we come. Now by your grace we come. Lord, if you mark our transgressions, who would stand? Thanks to your grace, we are cleansed by the blood of the Lamb. Lord, if you mark our transgressions, who would stand? Thanks to your grace, we are cleansed by the blood of the Lamb. Only by grace can we enter, only by grace can we stand, not by our human endeavor, but by the blood of the Lamb. Into your presence you call us, you call us to come, into your presence you draw us. Now by your grace we come, now by your grace we come, now by your grace we come. Okay, hello children and welcome to the kids talk today. Um, I can't see you, but you can see me, so... If you're there, please give me a big wave. Yep. And thumbs up. And give me a big high five without hitting the computer or the screen. Oh, (laughs) thank you. Well, I'm sure you're all at home, all snuggled up, possibly still in your pyjamas. Hopefully you've had breakfast and you're all ready to go. So let's get into it. Well, you're not here again, so I had to bring my friends as an audience. So... Who can remember these two? Now, if you can remember their names, what I was going to say is that if you can remember their names, I will bring you some chocolate. But because I'm not allowed outside of five kilometers of my house, maybe your parents can give you some chocolate. So if you know the names of this guy and this guy, then parents, you need to give your children some chocolate. Awesome. So I'll sit them down here. There is my audience. Okay, I'm ready to go. Okay, so we've been learning about uh, the covenant of works. Uh, And the first question, maybe I've got three more questions. 
But I'm not going to try and count in French again. So, Sebi, you can take your hands off your ears. Don't worry, I'm not going to um, do that again because I have been roasted enough over that. So, let's go. What, first question, in what condition did God make Adam and Eve? I can't hear you. What was that? Mr. Middleton? Holy and happy. Awesome. Okay. So he made Adam and Eve holy and happy. And he made a covenant with them. And that was the covenant of works. And we've been learning about that. And second question, what was Adam bound to do in the covenant of works? Can you answer that? God's law. And then there was that big word transgression, which Mr. Curry um, walked us through last week. Remember we had the, the thumbs up and the thumbs down, I think it was, or the, the tick and the cross. Yep, the do do. And transgression is doing what God forbids. So we know that. We know that sin is a transgression of God's law and it is doing what he forbids. So question 30, today's question. What was the sin of our first parents? Okay, now to do that, I'm going to need some helpers, but I am a bit light on today for helpers. So I look around, who, do I, who can I see? Bradley, jump up here. Okay, now let's just picture we're in the Garden of Eden and Bradley is a tree, so spread your branches. Yep, I've got some props I've got some props. Here you go. Hold that. You're, you're a beautiful tree in the garden. So let's read what it says from Scripture. This is Genesis 2 verse 8. And the Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east, and there he put a man who he had formed. And out of the ground the Lord made to spring up every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. So there were lots of trees in this garden. There was the tree of life was in the midst of the garden. So Bradley represents all the trees. And there was another tree in the midst, the tree of life. So Bradley, you just go to the side. Serena, jump up. This is, a tr this is the tree of life. So hold that up. Yep, there's the tree of life. So we're in the garden. We've got all the trees that God has formed um, We've got the tree of life in the midst of the garden. And then we have another tree. It says the tree of life was in the midst of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Who else can I use to volunteer? Looking around, Mr. Middleton. Oh, there you are. Jump up here. Okay. Uh, yep, stand next to Serena. And in the Bible, it said that... The trees were good um, to the sight and good for food. So we have food. Here's a banana, Bradley. Yep. Your fruit trees. Serena. And oh, an apple. <laughs> Bit of a cliche. I know, but yep. <laughs> there we go. Okay. So we've got the trees. But what was the sin of our first parents? Um Let's go a little bit further on in verse, chapter 2 to verse 16. This is reading from the Word of God. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree in the garden. Yep. Let's hold up your fruit, Serena. Yep. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. For in that day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. So, kids... Point to the tree that God commanded Adam and Eve not to eat from. This one. Doo -doo. Yep, we've got that one. So what trees can they eat from? All the other trees. Yep, 
And which one can they not eat from? Dude, dude. Yep. You're doing well. I think we've got this. So the question was, what was the sin of our first parents? And later on in chapter 3, when we learn about the fall, we read, So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, it was good, yep, and that it was a delight to the eyes, maybe I should have switched these guys around. Like, <laughs> yeah. So, so when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit and ate. Pass the fruit. I'm not the woman, but yeah. That's pretty good. So she ate, and then she gave some to her husband, and he also ate too. And that was their sin. God had told them, do not eat from this tree. But what did they do? They ate from the tree. So, children, what was the sin of our first parents? Do you know it? Have you been taught at home this week what that sin is? Our first parents ate the forbidden fruit. So do you remember what that word forbid means? It is a tra transgression. So a transgression is doing what God forbids. So they have transgressed God's law. They only had one, but they transgressed it. And that was the sin of our first parents. Cool. Thank you, team. Thank you. You can just put those down there. Okay, children, we've got that. So hopefully next week we can go on to the next question, question 31, and we'll learn about why they ate it. So we know what that sin was. They ate from the tree. Next week we learn why. Okay, now I'm going to pray, and then we will sing the children's song. So please, if you're at home, where are being quiet. Uh, maybe bow your head and... Um, just rest your hands in your lap um, so that we're not distracted and we'll pray to our Father in heaven. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the Bible, for your word, and that it is truth and that we know that it is. We thank you that you teach us about yourself. Um, you teach us about us also and our condition of sin. We we thank you for our children, that we can raise them and we can teach them uh, that in fact they are sinners, just like us, but that there is a solution to that sin. There is one that they may look to and be forgiven. Uh, we pray, Father, that as we teach our children at home, as we teach them about sin and about righteousness, that we may point them to Jesus as the only way that they may be saved from their sin. Father, we give thanks for today, uh, for being able to be together, even though physically distant. Um, we are able to hear your word, sing your praises, and love one another. So please strengthen our kids, we pray, that they may continue to grow, um, to know you, and to love Jesus, your son. In his name we pray, amen. to obey, to listen to his word. Yes, Jesus is my king. I'm living now for him, cause Jesus is my king. I don't deserve his mercy, I don't deserve his love, and yet he died to save me, died upon the cross. I'm following the king, I'm ready to obey, to listen to his word. Yes, Jesus is my king. I'm living now for him, cause Jesus is my king. I don't deserve his mercy, I don't deserve his love, and yet he died to save me, died upon the cross. I'm following the king, I'm ready to obey, to listen to his word. Yes, Jesus is my king, I'm living now for him, cause Jesus is my king.
We're going to open God's Word and hear from Paul's letter to Timothy, his first letter to Timothy, uh, chapter 3, verses 8 to 13. 1 Timothy, chapter 3, verses 8 to 13. Deacons likewise must be dignified, not double-tongued, not addicted to much wine, not greedy for dishonest gain. They must hold the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience, and let them also be tested first, then let them serve as deacons if they prove themselves blameless. Their wives, likewise, must be dignified, not slanderers, but sober-minded, faithful in all things. Let deacons each be the husband of one wife, managing their children and their own households well. For those who serve well as deacons gain a good standing for themselves and also great confidence in the faith that is in Christ Jesus. Thanks, Brad. Uh, well, what we'll do is we'll pray, we'll seek God's blessing upon uh, preaching of the word, and then we'll hear from that text. Let's uh, humble ourselves in prayer. Uh, Father, we, we read scripture every day. Uh, we, we hear the voice of God in speaking to us, but we also confess that at times uh, we uh, become very familiar with parts of the Bible. And uh, we can often let it wash over us and yet without really changing us. We would pray that as we reflect upon these qualifications for the diaconate, that you might speak to us all individually, that we ourselves might seek to be people who excel in Christian virtues. And so to this end, we pray that the gospel will be obvious in the way that we live. And for that to happen, we need your spirit to be working through your word to sanctify and wash us. And so that as we fix our eyes upon Christ, that he becomes more compelling and attractive and that we pursue him with all our hearts. To this end, we commit the preaching and the receiving of the word of God to you. For we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, a few... A few weeks back now, before lockdown, uh, my oldest son, Joey, uh, came, said, oh, can I come over, we'll fix up the car a bit, change over some brake pads, that sort of stuff. I said, yeah, yeah, sure, no problems, come over, I'll, I'll give you a hand. I don't want to do it for him, wanted to teach him, so just sort of guide him through it. Anyway, I pulled out the tro trolley jack and just about to put it under the front, but I said to him, oh, before we jack it up, you better undo the wheel nuts while there's you know, still friction on the ground so the wheels don't turn. And so, most of you know, you could picture Joey, he's, 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 a, he's a gym freak, and so he's, he's got pretty big biceps, uh, impressive in many ways. So anyway, though, I, I'm watching him, and he's leaning into this wheel brace to, to loosen the nuts, and he's groaning away, trying to break the seals on these wheel nuts. First couple, can't do it, don't budge, don't budge, thinks to himself, well, they're obviously really hard ones. So <coughs> he works his way through all five of the wheel nuts and he can't, he can't break a single wheel nut. And then each time, he's like this and, he's, and then he keeps looking behind him at me and I'm trying to conceal my mirth. Um, and no, the actual truth is, I actually did really want him to break the wheel nuts because I just wanted to avoid that, that very awkward father-son moment that we could all sense was coming. So anyway, so I thought I'd help him out. I went into the garage and I grabbed uh, a big, what we call a breaker bar. It's about that long, put a socket on the end and it gives you just a mechanical leverage. So I throw in that and I said, <laughs> said you should be able to knock them all off with that. So off he goes. <laughs> I, I tell you, every time he couldn't do one, he, he would nervously look back and then he moved to the next one. And I'm just doing my best to keep a straight face. Not a single wheel nut budged. And then finally in defeat, he turns to me. And we both know what's going on. I mean, it is literally killing him. And so he finally looks at me with this sheepish grin, but he couldn't bring himself to actually say the words. And so I said it for him, son, would you like your 54-year-old father to have a go? And so I took the breaker bar and I broke his heart 
one wheel nut at a time. You see, sometimes the biceps that look the most impressive are not always the best choice for the job. Well, what is true with biceps and strength is also true when it comes to gifts and character. See, the truth is, and we all know how this works, we are, consciously or subconsciously, we are drawn to those with great intellect or beauty or ability or, or talents. We're just drawn to them. To those who outwardly look impressive and they may have charismatic personalities or they're brilliant sports people or attractive celebrities or amazing musicians. And we're drawn to them in a way that we're not drawn to reliable accountants or faithful elders or kind mothers. Our culture, our sin nature is drawn to that which is outwardly impressive. And you know, even, even those people, even if they were uh, arrogant or aggressive or uh, callous or conceited, whether they were deceitful or even dogmatic, uh, whether we knew that they were impatient or inconsiderate, we would still be drawn to them. We'd give them a free pass because of their gifts or their talents or their abilities or their looks. And that is in contrast to God and his word. There's in contrast between culture and celebrity and those who climb the ladder of success and what God considers to be good and profitable and winsome and attractive. Because God's primary concern is with someone's character, not their gifts. And I know that you know that, but I also know that we are drawn to gifts, not character. We, we appreciate, and again, God's word does. God's word appreciates those whom he gifts with intelligence or good looks or charisma or gifts. But what the Bible does, it says, is over and above all those gifts, all those other things, over and above all that, what God values is character, is the heart. And primarily that means a heart that is not just right with him, but, but hearts that are shaped by him. Men and women who are shaped by his gospel. Hearts that understand that, that character is far more important than gifts. And so when you look to the biblical qualifications like you find in Timothy and Titus, where it lists these are the qualifications for anyone in leadership, whether that as an overseer or an elder, the words are um, synonymous, or with a deacon, what you find is that it always lists character, virtues. Because you can teach any donkey theology. You can teach anyone skills, but you can't teach character. So it's no surprise that, that verse after verse, chapter after chapter, when he looks at leadership, that the Bible always bangs on about virtues, bangs on about the Christian's character because that's more important than gifts. So when we turn to the text, what, what is immediately obvious is that the qualifications, and this is telling, the qualifications for the office of deacon actually overlap with the office of elder. Chapter 3 begins with the elders and the, or the overseers, and it says what they must be. And, and it gives nine virtues, qualifications for that. And then... Having done that, when you get down to our text today, verse 8, it then says, likewise, deacons likewise. So elders must be, deacons likewise must be. And then what you find is that list of qualifications, of the nine qualifications, six of them overlap with deacons. So the, the qualifications for being an elder and a deacon are in many ways very, very similar, except elders obviously need to be apt to teach and lead, and that's not requirement of a deacon. But what you realize, I hope what you're already seeing is that what's important to God is not gifts, but character. That's what's so integral to leadership. And I would argue leadership, not just in the church, but in the home and even in the state. You don't want someone with the biggest brain 
They want someone with the purest heart. And so in the text, uh, verses 8 through to 10, you get these general qualifications for all deacons. And then in verse 11, you get specific qualifications for female deacons. And in verse 12, specific to male deacons. And then verse 13, you get this summary verse about how it makes them all, if they're good at their work as deacons in their office, that will cause them um, to be worthy of much praise. So starting again with verse 8, deacons likewise must be dignified. That is, just like elders. Just as elders have to be dignified, deacons have to be dignified. To be dignified means you are worthy of respect, you are worthy of honour, that people who look to you automatically see something in your character that they believe is worthy of praise, worthy of honour, worthy of repetition. And what the first thing you need to know as we go through this, and I hope you can pick this up, is that that is true of every Christian. That these qualifications for elders and deacons to be dignified, every Christian must be dignified. Every Christian must live a life worthy of the gospel, worthy of honour, worthy of praise, worthy of being copied. You see, these qualifications... They're not something just for a few, select few. They're for all of God's people. But what it's saying about those whom you might elect to the office of deacon is that these who would serve as deacons must be known. Must be known to flesh out these very virtues. We're all called to them, but many of us fall short of them. And what we're all called to you choose deacons of those who actually have a proven track record, who are known to be those who live a dignified life, known and respected in the congregation. And then if you were to drop down to verse 11, where it pivots to their wives, uh, which we'll see a little bit later on, I'm going to argue is women deacons. It's actually not wives, should be women. Um, but likewise, notice what it says, likewise, the wives, and again, I'll come back to that, they must be, these women must also be known to be dignified, to have lived lives worthy of honour, worthy of respect. And so what you get in verses 8 and following is it says, then what would it look like if, this is qualifications for all deacons, what would it look like to live a dignified life? Well, it says, they mustn't be double-tongued, not addicted to much wine, and not greedy for dishonest gain. That is, those activities would disqualify you for being described as dignified. If, if you were known to be two-faced, that is, you know, you, you, you have one conversation with someone and then you say that thing to them and then you say something totally different to someone else and you just work the crowd like that. You might say that's been two-faced or double-tongued, or if you're a heavy drinker, or if you have desire for um, easy money, you're a bit lazy, looking for shortcuts all the time, what the Scripture would call dishonest gain. And so it says those things are inconsistent with someone who lives a dignified life. And so when you're looking at the congregation, if, you, if they have any of those qualities, those poor qualities, they can't be dignified, therefore you don't vote for them. And then if you drop down again to verse 11 where it deals with female deacons or deaconesses, you get a similar list for the women. They, they, likewise, they must be dignified. Well, what would it look like for them to be dignified? Well, he puts it in the negative. Well, they won't be slanderous. Uh, the Greek word there is often used, uh, is the word that's used of the devil telling lies. It says they won't be slanderers, but they'll actually be sober-minded, and he says faithful in all things. In other words, deacons can't be those who make false or damaging statements about other people. If you're known as one of those people who likes to gossip, who likes to talk about other people's failings or situations, that, that, that make damaging statements, then you're not qualified or you're not dignified. You can't take an office of, of the diaconate. Or if you're overly emotional and you lack sensibility and you're not sober-minded, it would disqualify you of being worthy of respect. And positively, 
she would be known to be faithful in all things. And the idea there is she'd be faithful in every sphere. Faithful with all things. Faithful in all of her relationships. As she fleshes out the Christian life, this female deacon shall be known as a person who is faithful. Which is very similar, of course, to verse 9, where it's talking about general qualifications again. And it says, And deacons must hold on to the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience. That is, they must be faithful to the gospel. They don't have to be theologians. They have to be the sharpest biblical minds. They just need to hold on to things with a clear conscience. They need to believe the gospel and to flesh it out in a faithful way. And then what you get is you go down, you get in verse 10, you get this requirement which is then specific uh, to men. Uh, sorry, um, verse 12. It says, Let deacons each be the husband of one wife, managing their children in their households, well, uh, and again, uh, the, the Greek there means to be a one-man woman. Uh, so that's, that's the ESB translated as a husband of one wife, i.e. it might be suggesting that, um, you know, rules out polygamy or divorce or something like that. That's not what the text actually says. It says he's a one-woman man. It's speaking about his reputation to fidelity. It's speaking about this is a man who has eyes for his wife and for his wife only. He's not a bloke known to have an eye that goes sideways. But he's a one-woman man who is respected in the home. Both his spouse and his kids respect him. He's not perfect. No one is. But he's known to love his wife and be a one-woman man and for his family to function in such a way that he has respect. And again, that's clearly, it's a specific requirement of male elders because obviously they're the heads and the leaders of their homes. Because according to the scripture, you can't be dignified if there are questions over your sexual fidelity and your home life. That's not a dignified life where people are saying, but look at his home life. Well, this is the guy who, who, who watches pornography or this is the guy who has affairs or, or talks about women in these ways that are demeaning. And, and so the text is saying, no, 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 this male deacon, he must be one woman man worthy of respect and has that respect in the home. But again, I want you to see through the games for all this, this is not peculiar to them. All Christian men are supposed to be one women men. All, not, not just some, not just the leaders, every single Christian man, if he is to be married, will be a one woman man. He'll have eyes for his wife and that will be it. And essentially, what is he doing? He's, he's, he's telling you what Ephesians 6, 1 to 4 says. In fact, every one of these qualifications I could have out, put, uh, pulled out of the book of Ephesians, chapters 4, 5 and 6. It's the application of the gospel. That's what I want you to see as we're going through. This isn't about, oh, well, this is only a thing for deacons. I'm not thinking about gay. It doesn't apply to me. No, it does. Because you're supposed to be excelling in every one of these virtues, male and female. Because these are true to every Christian. Because if you want to live a dignified, worthy life for the gospel, that's what it's got to look like. That's why all Christians, not just male and female deacons, must learn how to control their tongues. Ephesians 4.29 Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such which is good for building up, as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. All Christians must learn to control their appetites. Not just when it comes to alcohol, but, but all appetites. That's just simply Ephesians 5.18 Do not get drunk on wine, that is debauchery but be filled with the Spirit. And the implication is the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, and gentleness, and self-control. Every Christian is called to that. All Christians, every single Christian, is called to contribute to their community by hard and honest work. That's simply Ephesians 4.28. Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor doing honest work with his own hands so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. 
and all Christians are meant to hold on to the mystery of the faith. That is, all Christians are called to be faithful in all things, including their marriages and their relationships. So whether they eat or drink or whatever you do, you do it to the glory of God. 1 Corinthians 10 verse 31. So what becomes obvious as you plough your way through the various qualifications for the diaconate is that simply these qualifications are the same of every single Christian, but the diaconate, they're supposed to be exemplars of it. They're supposed to be the ones who in the congregations we can say, ah, yeah, he or she is known for that. They, they live a worthy Christian life. And in that sense... It makes voting on a diaconate really simple. You vote for those in your congregation who are known to exhibit such character, such virtue. And you don't vote on charisma or personality or talents. You don't vote for them because you like them. Glad that you like them, but that is not a qualification for office. You don't vote for your friends. You don't vote for someone else because you don't like them. That's nonsense. We're not called to, there's no imperative in Scripture to like each other. None. But there is to love one another. You don't vote just for your friends. You vote for those who are known to be dignified and worthy of respect. Those who you know can control their tongues and their appetites and contribute by hard work and honest faith and hold to the faith. There's your criteria. I'm looking for those in the congregation who are known to control their tongues, control their appetites, contribute by hard and honest work, and they hold to the faith. They're faithful in all things. And then you go vote for them. Because character is far more important than gifts. See, the diaconate is actually about mercy work. Deacons are going to be dealing with practical issues in the congregation. That's why it's so important they have control over their tongues. You can't have them sharing private information or repeating details. They must be discreet and trustworthy and faithful in all things, especially conversations. Why you have a reference to them being sober-minded, not addicted to much wine, because they're known to have self-control over their appetites. They can be trusted with the fine china of someone's life without breaking it. And remember, back in biblical days, the deacons also had access to and looked after the church finances. Now, we won't do that. They won't do that in our church because our code book gives that responsibility, property and finances, to the board but the board will still allocate the money which they'll disperse on behalf of their work. But you can see why originally they had to be known to be trustworthy and, 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 and hard workers so that a bit, they wouldn't end up a bit like Judas who, the scripture says, stole from the money bag. And in that sense, when we're thinking of the diaconate, we're not looking for who the best Bible teacher is. We're not looking for who is the sharpest theological mind. It's going to be possible that, that a great deacon may not even have read the Westminster Confession of Faith, though my suggestion is you probably should. But here's what the Bible says. They must hold and be known to hold to a sincere faith and hold on to that gospel firmly. We want gospel men and women as our deacons, as our servants. And that's why Paul concludes in verse 13, he says, and for those who serve well as deacons, he says, they gain a good standing for themselves and also great confidence in the faith that is in Christ Jesus. That is, deacons who serve well are deacons who will grow in honour among people. My son, uh, Malachi, the youngest, shocked me at the time. Anyway, we, we were doing family devotions and then he, he runs into his room, grabs out his Bible and then he flicks to one of the Proverbs and he said, oh, this is an awesome proverb I found this week. And he finds the proverb that says that humility comes before honour. And he got it. He said, so you first pursue humility if you want to receive honour. 
And that's what a text saying here, that, that, that as these deacons, as they do their work, they will grow in their honour in the congregation. The congregation will grow in their respect for them. And they will also grow in their confidence before Jesus Christ. So they'll grow in their confidence vertically before Christ as they serve. And they will grow in their confidence horizontally as they serve amongst us. Because as deacons, they're going to grow like Jesus in a sense. Because remember, Jesus is the deacon of all deacons. He's the servant of all servants. And that's what a deacon is, the servant. Remember Philippians 2, verse 3 to 8. Jesus models what it is to be a deacon. He models what it is to be a servant. Do nothing, it says, out of selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility, because humility comes before honour. In humility, count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind amongst yourselves which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God, something that might be grasped, but emptied himself by taking on the form of a servant, that is, a deacon, being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. And he goes on to say that he would then receive his honour because then he will be the name above all names, of which every knee will bow, because humility comes before honour. So now you know what deacons must be. In a sense, they are the exemplars of the ordinary. They're known to be dignified and faithful. They're going to model for us um, unity and humility and service just like Christ. So now you know what they must be. I just want to finish by going back to that issue of women deacons in verse 11. Um, because there has in the past been some tension around whether women actually can be deacons. And primarily it's predicated on this verse because the ESV, so let me just state, here's our, here's our starting position. Uh, 1 Timothy 2, here's Paul, and he says, I do not permit a woman, I'm just paraphrasing, I do not permit a woman to teach or have authority over man. Right? So there's your basic starting point. Women can't be elders or overseers in the church because that is an office of teaching, because an elder must be apt to teach, and one of leading or authority because it says he must lead his own family well because he's going to lead the family of church well. Eldership is one of teaching and leadership which rules out and will always rule out female elders. But the diaconate is not an office of teaching or leadership. It is an act as an office of mercy and servanthood. And so at that very principal uh, basis, there's, there's no conflict of why a woman couldn't take the office. But it just comes to these verses like this, where... The ESV translates verse 11, their wives likewise. And when it does that, and I, I love the ESV, it is the best translation of the Bible, but it's not perfect. But, but it says, their wives likewise. And what it's saying is, these aren't women deacons, these are the wives of deacons. So the first few verses are, male deacons will be da 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 and then their wives will show these sort of things. Now, that actually is not a translation. That is an explanation as the ESV does it. Because in the text, the Greek word that is translated wives or women is the same Greek word as gynaikos. And so uh, there is no word, a separate word for women or wives, but we have in the English, in the Greek. It's just the word is gynaikos. And then you've got to work out by context does Paul mean women or wives? Now, the ESV goes with wives, which is possible, but not probable. But that you can translate gunakes as wives, but it goes a step further because it then translates it their wives. So in other words, it has a qualifier, a possessive. But that's not in the Greek text. Actually, they just added that to the text. It, the text does not say their wives likewise. It says 
Likewise, gunekes. Likewise, gunekes. Likewise, the only way you could translate that is wives or women, but it's not theirs. And as soon as you take out the possessive, it changes the flavour of the text. In fact, if Paul did want to say their wives, he could have done that easily. Uh, there's a Greek word called auton, which means their. Or he could have used uh, the Greek word idiom, which means um, their own wives. So he could have easily done it if he wanted to do that. He could have added those Greek words and that would have been very clear. He's talking about their wives, the deacon's wives. He does not do that. He just uses the word gunekes, likewise gunekes, likewise women. And then he gives their qualifications. And he does that in the same way as he does it in 1 Timothy 2.9, just a little bit earlier. And he uses the same construction. And it's so obvious there that it's meant to be women and not wives. So that's, that's the first thing I want to say. Here's the second thing. That if you look at the construction, it makes sense. So elders must be. Deacons, all deacons likewise must be. And then it goes in verse 11. Women, gnekes likewise must be. And so it's showing you that there's three officers there. There's a male and a female deacon. But then you might say, well, then why doesn't he just call in verse 8 the male deacons deacons? And then when you get to verse 11, why doesn't he say deaconess? Good question. Well, again, the Greek language. Blame it on the Greeks. Because the Greek language only has one word for deacon, and it's, it is a masculine um, that's attached to it, but it's meant to serve duty for both male and female. There was no Greek word for female deacon. There's no such word as deaconess in the Greek language. It's just a deacon. And, and we know that because if you went to the end of um, Romans 16, I think it's verse 1 or 2, and he's talking about Phoebe, and he speaks of Phoebe, and he introduces her and he says, I'm recommending her to you. Receive Phoebe, and it says, who is a deacon of the church at Shenkreye. And he uses the same word, a diakonos, a deacon. And so here is this woman, Phoebe, who he clearly refers to as a deacon of that church at Shenkreye. And so we have examples of deacons in the Bible who are female. And so verse 11, properly understood, it, it speaks of a woman, likewise, guneke, these women elders, this is what there is qualification. Here are male elders, uh, male deacons, there is qualification. And then it does general ones. So you look at the structure again. Verse 2, all overseers must be. Verse 8, all deacons likewise must be. Verse uh, 13, uh, women, uh, verse 11, sorry, women likewise must be. That is female deacons. And so both men and women can serve as servants of the church but they must be known to be dignified. Because deacons must be known for their character, not their gifts. Amen? Then let's pray. Our gracious King, we thank you that you have blessed your church with the office of elder and deacon, an, an office of elder that is one of teaching and leading, and the offer office of deacon, which is one of mercy and service. And we thank you that the model for both offices is Jesus Christ, because he is the servant of all servants, and he is the teacher of all teachers, and the leader of all leaders, and he has modeled for us the sort of character and the sort of virtues that the Christian church demands of her leaders, of her servants. And so as we wrestle with uh, the diaconate, our gracious King, we pray that we might be informed through your word, but more than that, that we wouldn't just be thinking about what the few might look like, but your word might challenge us so that we realize we're all supposed to be like this. We're all supposed to be virtuous. We're all supposed to be humble. We're all supposed to be dignified. We're all supposed to control our tongues and our appetites and contribute to the well-being of others. And so, Father, make us as a church, a church that live lives which are worthy of the gospel. 
and from the youngest to the oldest amongst us, that we, that we might pursue these things because Christ has loved us and redeemed us. And so our lives are now His. And we will serve Him in whatever way benefits His name and glorifies His church and builds up His people. And so hear our prayers. Bless us through your word and give us grace now as we sing in response. For we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we're going to respond now to God's word. We're going to do that as we sing our song of response. When I survey the wondrous cross. survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died. My richest gain I count but loss and poor contempt on all my pride. my God all the vain things that charm me most I sacrifice them to his blood see from his head his hands his feet so We've come to the time in our service now when we can uh, respond and we'll do that by way of pastoral prayer. Um, let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time that we have had uh, this morning. Despite being physically apart, uh, we know that we are joined uh, together as part of your body, um, part of your church through the work of your Holy Spirit. And we thank you for that. Father, we thank you for uh, your word this morning, which we have heard preached to us. Um, Those who are here in the church building and those who are in their own homes, we have heard your word. Uh, We are thankful that your word continues to teach us, um, that it continues to mold our hearts in the way in which you want to do. To uh, bend our lives, not to our wills, but to your will. Um, Father, we thank you um, that we do have such a great high priest, Jesus the Christ, to whom we have this access to you and confidence that we can come to you in prayer. We thank you that uh, you have called us out of the darkness, uh, out of the bondage uh, to sin uh, and death in which we are born into this world through the sin of our first parents, which we inherit from Adam. Um, 
that you have rescued us through your son, through uh, repentance and faith in him. And if we do have this faith and trust in him, uh, then we have a new head. It is no longer Adam. It is Jesus, your son. Father, we thank you that uh, he did come. Uh, he came in humility. He lived a life that was obedient to you. He uh, looked to you at all times, and then he gave up his life um, on the cross for sinners, for those who, uh, who you knew. And it was that great transaction where we received his righteousness, and he bore our sin. He saw, bore the wrath, your wrath, on all unrighteousness. Father, we thank you that we have uh, such a great king who has gone before us. Uh, we pray, Father, for those who this week have been struggling, um, who are struggling more and more. At each lockdown, it becomes harder, and we know that, uh, particularly for those who are living by themselves, who are already struggling with that loneliness, Father. For those who are uh, struggling with hardships, those with mental illness, those who are physically ailed, um, and also those who are struggling spiritually. Um, the news of another lockdown is not the news that we want to hear. But, but we know, Father, that this is all from your hand, uh, the workings in this wor world, uh, um, your will, but we just pray that uh, we may not become hardened, that our hearts may not become hardened, but remain soft, Father, that we may receive mercy and grace from you, that you may pour that out on our lives, uh, that we may continue in perseverance the race in which we are running, that we may not take our minds off being gospel-minded, amidst a world that seems in chaos. Father, we pray that you'll continue to strengthen us in this way, that we may continue to love those around us, that we may care for those who are struggling, that we may continue to pray for those who are leading us, uh, those in government, uh, whether that be federal or state, uh, the leaders in our church, that we may continue to pray for them. Uh, Father, we pray that this might be used as a time of refining your church. Um, when we lose certain things, it does expose our hearts. It exposes the little idols in our lives that are present. So we pray, Father, that as these idols are exposed, whether they be security, uh, safety, uh, hope of a, a nice future or retirement, Father, as these idols are exposed in our lives, we pray that we may confess them to you and we may turn and trust in Jesus the Christ. Father, we pray for uh, India at the moment, and particularly Urfa, the work that is going on over there. They've just been ravaged by COVID, particularly the church, uh, the loss of many pastors and ministers. And this is hard, particularly in a church which uh, the leadership structure is not very deep. And that these congregations who lose their ministers and their pastors uh, sometimes lose their way. And we pray that this might not be so, that you might raise up men who are able to serve, who are able to teach your church and continue to grow your body. Father, we pray for India itself and the toll that COVID is taking on them, uh, that you may be merc merciful and gracious to them. Uh, we pray uh, for Richard Wilson and his team as they continue to work um, with the Christians in India. We also think of Indonesia who are also um, struggling hugely with uh, coronavirus and the toll that it's taking on their nation. We pray that as it ravages through their country that uh, many may turn and seek the true God, um, the God who offers true life. 
So we pray for that country, but we also pray for the gospel and for those who uh, love you. Father, we pray that as we have um, heard about uh, diaconate, um, the teaching from Scripture, uh, their, their office of mercy and service, that as we seek to uh, point uh, deacons in our congregation, that we may look at the true character of the men and women that we are uh, putting up for that role. Um, that they may be humble and they may meet the qualifications. We pray that this may be a great service to your, your church here at North Geelong and the work in which we do. Father, we also pray for the board as they manage finances, that they will continue to handle them wisely and that they may be well used for the work of ministry and gospel in the Geelong area. Father, we think of um, Dorothy, Dorothy Smith's family um, after her passing this last week, and we pray that as her family grieves, that you may comfort them and that they may learn of the faith that she had. We just pray that you will comfort them in this time, um, given that it is a hard time with the restriction on numbers for funerals and gatherings. We think of um, some of our families. We think of the Kenny families, and we pray for them, for Paul and Jess and Flynn. Uh, we also think of Don and uh, his wife. <laughs> Sorry, which I had a blank. We pray for them. Um, so we bring them before you, as well as Shirley and Murray, who are um, getting towards their latter years. We pray that their bodies may continue uh, to be strengthened. Uh, we look forward to seeing them again when we can meet in person. We also think of Katie Jamison, uh, that you'll strengthen her too. Um, we have a couple of families in lockdown um, who are having to isolate uh, the Hormans and the Haymans, so we think of them too in this time uh, where they cannot leave their home, cannot do the things that they usually do during the week. So please, Father, strengthen those two families. Uh, may we care and love for them and continue to pray for them throughout this time. Father, uh, this is your day, the Lord's day, uh, where we are gathered together. Uh, even though it is online, we are thankful for the technology that allows this. For those who are serving, we think of Brandon who tirelessly serves to keep uh, the service running. For those who are serving here at North Geelong this morning, we uh, thank you for that service. And Father, we pray that uh, as we go into this new week, that you will forgive our sins as we confess them in Christ. We pray, Father, that you will give us confidence in our faith that we may live a life that is dignified and worthy, worthy of our calling to which we have been called. Um, we have a hope we have a secure future in Christ. And we pray this morning that as we go enjoy our afternoon of um, time together, that we, will, we, may, we may think of those who do not have those around them, that we may be able to encourage them, build them up by way of phone call, message. Father, we thank you for all of this. Uh, you know our needs. You know our struggles. And you are the Father over all of us. Father, we pray to you. And we pray with confidence because we pray in the name of Jesus Christ. In his name we pray. Amen. days as God has numbered I was made to walk with him yet I look for worldly treasure and forsake the king of kings but mine is hope in my redeemer though I fall his love is sure for Christ has paid for every failing, I am His 
So wherever you are this morning, uh, receive the blessing of the Lord, which comes to you uh, in Jesus Christ. Just remember that as we go this week, we will wear his name as his people. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. So shall they put my name upon the people of Israel and I will bless them. Amen.